So I want to talk to you today about the future of our species and really the future of life. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Within a century or two, Earth will be dominated by entities that are more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. Because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. These will be the main products of the economy, of the 21st century economy. Not textiles and vehicles and weapons, but bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Those who control the data control the future, not just of humanity, but the future of life itself. Because today, data is the most important asset in the world. Now, why is data so important? It's important because we have reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. There is a lot of talk these days about hacking computers and email accounts and bank accounts and mobile phones, but actually we are gaining the ability to hack human beings. Now what do you need in order to hack a human being? You need two things. You need a lot of computing power and you need a lot of data especially biometric data. Not data about what I buy or where I go, but data about what is happening inside my body and inside my brain. Until today, nobody had the necessary computing power and the necessary data to hack humanity. Till today, most surveillance was above the skin and now it's going under the skin. What I mean by that is that until today, most surveillance, whether by corporations like Facebook or, or Amazon, or whether by governments, it was mostly about what you do in the world, where you go, who you meet, which TV shows you see, which news uh, you read online. But they didn't look under the skin what's happening inside your body, uh, inside your brain. Now, the main thing we want to know is actually inside the body. We want to know whether you're sick or not, whether you have COVID-19, what's your body temperature, your blood pressure, your heart rate. And this changes the nature of surveillance. Of course, at present, the focus is just on the disease, but feelings are biological phenomena just like diseases. The same surveillance that can tell whether you have COVID-19 can also tell when you're angry, when you're joyful, when you're bored. So if you're now watching this interview and you have, say, a biometric bracelet on your wrist that monitors what's happening in your body, I could know whether you agree with me or not. Whether you think that, oh, this is scary, or nah, this is crazy, what is this guy talking about? Whether you are bored or whatever. Now imagine 10 years from now, in a place like, I don't know, North Korea, when every citizen has to wear a biometric bracelet 24 hours a day, and if you watch a speech by the big leader, you can smile and you can clap your hands, but you have no control over what's happening inside your body. If you're actually angry about the big leader, they will know it. This is a kind of totalitarian system that even George Orwell didn't imagine in 1984. Since this is not the last crisis of the 21st century, there could be more epidemics. There are other problems like climate change. All of them will become worse if we now start competing and fighting among each other. All of them it will be easier to deal with if we now develop global solidarity. I know that in recent years we saw populist politicians undermining deliberately the trust that people have in important institutions like universities, like respectable media outlets. These populist politicians told people that, say, scientists are this small elite disconnected from the real people. You shouldn't believe them. And you had all these conspiracy theories that climate change is just a hoax, it's not real, and that the earth is actually flat, and that vaccination
infections are bad for you, and this spread. But I don't think it's too late. Especially in an emergency, people can change their views very fast and they can discover hidden reservoirs of trust. You look in this crisis, who do people trust? They trust scientists above everything else in, in all countries. In Israel, they close down the synagogues. In Iran, they close the mosques. Churches all over the world are telling people don't come to church. The Pope is doing all these ceremonies on, 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 on Zoom or YouTube. And why do they do all this? Because the scientists recommended it. Even the religious leaders have trust in the scientists in this moment of emergency. And I hope people will remember it after the crisis is over, that this is where you go to get really reliable information. This is who you trust in an emergency. So when this crisis is over, and in a year or two years, scientists come and warn us about, say, climate change, then we don't say, oh, this is just hoax. These scientists, why should we believe them? Remember who do you believe today, even after the crisis is over. I think there's a huge impetus now for a national digital infrastructure. Digitization in, in healthcare is, I think, one of the great game changers. You know, we should be helping countries to develop a national digital infrastructure, which they will need with these new vaccines. And then, you know, finally, it, it, it's, it's also about showing people and showing the political leadership that you can make a positive difference to your healthcare system by adopting these measures because they've got a They've got an impact beyond any particular disease and, or, or, or pandemic. I think the sort of unforgivable politics and forgivable politics. <coughs> um, the, the unforgivable politics is turning a public health issue into a political issue. I mean, I remember at the beginning of the, at the onset of COVID, people saying, well, what do you think <coughs> of the politics of COVID? How serious is this disease? And I was like, well, you asked me about the politics of the disease. I mean, it's a disease. I don't, I don't know. You go and ask someone who knows. <laughs> so what's unforgivable is turning things like whether you wear a face mask or not into a political issue. That is unforgivable and stupid. Um, and I also think this, this issue to do with the technology and the digital infrastructure, I just want to emphasize how important I think that is. Because in the end, you, 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 you need the data you need to know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been. Some of the vaccines that will come on down the line will be multiple, there'll be multiple shots. So you've got to have, for, for reasons to do with the healthcare more generally, but certainly for a, a pandemic or for, um, for, for vaccines, you've got to have a proper digital infrastructure. And many countries don't have that. In fact, most countries don't have that. So again, you've got to say, okay, who are the people that can make this happen? How do you get the right partnerships in place? So my, my view is, this is what I'm arguing with the, to, that should happen in the G, G20 particularly, I think, which is, I mean, G7 is an important forum, but the G20 is the broader forum, um, is you, you've got to work out what is it that you want to achieve in order to make sure that any future pandemic is properly handled and what are the partnerships that you're going to create in order to ensure that the answers you get are the right answers? And then you're going to have to have the mechanisms of implementation. It's a great pleasure to be part of this signing ceremony for the WHO Global Digital Health Certification Network Uptake Ceremony. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the value of digital health solutions in facilitating access to health services. While the emergency phase of the COVID-19 pandemic is now over, investments in digital infrastructure remain an important resource for health systems and for economies and societies at large. Like many countries, the European Union made significant investments in COVID-19 certificates to help people move around as safely as possible during the pandemic. 
the European Union certification system was used by all 27 EU member states and more than 50 other countries. Building on the success of the EU system, WHO is proud today to launch the Global Digital Health Certification Network. So thank you so much to European uh, Union for the excellent certification system that you have transferred to us and we have the chance to build on it. WHO will begin operations of the network today with the existing COVID-19 certificate as a global public good. Soon after, we will expand this infrastructure by incorporating other use, such as a digitized international certificate of vaccination, routine immunization cards, and international patient summaries. WHO will continue to work with all regions to ensure that the network is accessible globally, incorporating relevant experiences and standards from other countries and regions. The Global Digital Health Certification Network will be an important part of our efforts to strengthen health systems and support our member states to prepare better for the next epidemic or pandemic. The network could also play a crucial role in cross-border humanitarian situations by ensuring people have access to their health records and credentials as they move across borders due to conflict, the climate crisis, and other emergencies. WHO would like to thank again the European Commission for its partnership and support and for advocating the EU member states and other participants that they migrate to the WHO network. I also thank the EU and WHO teams who worked hard to bring us to this moment. We very much value the European Commission's technical and financial support, and we very much hope that support will continue. WHO looks forward to implementing this administrative arrangement and furthering our collaboration so that all member states can equitably reap the benefits of this vital digital public infrastructure. The pioneering digital partnership we are launching today is the opening of a new chapter in our partnership. The WHO is a cornerstone of the global health architecture and an indispensable ally for our European Health Union. For the European Health Union, today is also an important day for our contribution to global health. A central pillar for the EU's COVID response is the EU Digital COVID Certificate, which is now being scaled up to global level. This was developed in record time, in the most difficult period of the pandemic. This unique open source system, built on the power of science to get our economies and our societies moving again. It showed our citizens the light at the end of the tunnel and protected at the same time public health amid the uncertainty of the pandemic. And this EU success story quickly became a global standard. We worked hard with all our international partners to ensure that their national certificates could be recognized under the EU COVID certificate framework. Today, the framework has already been taken up by almost 80 countries. It is truly an example of what we can achieve when the world comes together. And I'm delighted that as of July 1st, the World Health Organization will take up the framework of the EU Digital COVID Certificate. Although COVID-19 is no longer a public health emergency of international concern, this new system will remain a key part of our global preparedness to face future health threats. And through this system, we will build a genuine world standard in digital health documentation. Its global successor, the WHO Global Digital Health Certification Network, is the new chapter in the development of digital health. And as the pandemic has shown us all very clearly, Digital health does have the ability to transform healthcare systems around the world and deliver better healthcare to citizens. And all you need in order to systematically hack millions of people is just the data. Mm -hmm. 
that to hack people means to know people better than they know themselves. Right. To, to somebody in San Francisco, in Beijing, knows you, yeah. knows more about you than you know about yourself, mm -hmm. about your medical condition, about your mental weaknesses, things that you did five years ago, 20 years ago, you completely forgot about them, they yeah. know it. Right. This is something we never faced before. Not even the KGB could do it. Right. And if we allow this kind of data to be accumulated by a few corporations or governments, the result will be really the end of democracy in the free market yeah. and the creation of new kinds of totalitarian regimes mm -hmm. or total surveillance regimes in which and somebody knows you better and can therefore manipulate you mm -hmm. and can therefore predict mm -hmm. what everything you're going to do. Yeah. And we are already beginning to see the emergence of such total surveillance regimes yeah. in places like Xinjiang, in places like in my own home country in Israel, we have this big laboratory of surveillance called the Occupied Territories, mm -hmm. where you have 2.5 million guinea pigs of how to completely survey and control a, uh, a population yeah. with very few soldiers yeah. to control millions of people if you have their data. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.